school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. Since that time, we have established branch schools throughout the United States and in various parts of the world. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our international president and board of trustees, Dr. Gary Mathis. Our international dean and international vice president, who is also a licensed medical doctor in the state of California, Dr. Robert Harris. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a superincorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine vision and understood in Revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title 
may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We go about in this school to show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The primary constitutional objectives and aims of the Institute are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, and modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal, eternal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. At this time, we will have prayer by Camille Pete from our Los Angeles branch school followed by a scripture from Richard Davis from our Springfield, Ohio branch school. May we all bow our hearts in a moment of prayer. O oh, gracious Yahweh, our Elohim, you have seen fit to establish us in this great and most beautiful town so that we may be proof of your word and your son. Yahweh, you said you will make us to believe. You said you will make us sit down. If it be thy will, and I know it is, make us sit down and make us hear the word that your son is speaking unto us so that we, we can leave here saying that it was well to have been here and so that the people around us can see that it is true, that it is truly divine vision that Dr. H.C. Kinley did have in the year of 1931 and that your word is still being spread throughout the world and that it will continue to be spread throughout the world. So sit and let us listen, Yahweh, to your word. And I ask that if there be any more prayers for anyone to say. Let it be said in the name of Yahshua Messiah. Let us say hallelujah.
for the scripture this afternoon, or rather this evening, I'll read from 2 Timothy, the third chapter. I'll read this from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, revised by the late A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association, first copyright issued in 1963. That'll be 2 Timothy, the third chapter. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of Yahweh, having a form of the worship of Yahweh, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away the, with various lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, is, now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all Yahweh delivered me. Yea, and all that will live in fear of Yahweh shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Yahshua the Messiah. All the scripture that is given by inspiration of Yahweh is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yahweh may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That was Second Timothy, third chapter. For our first speaker of the session, we will have Susan Sikelski from our Providence, Rhode Island School. Excuse me, before we start the program, we will have a brief announcement from my hostess, Janet Gibson. Again, the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research, Incorporated, takes great pleasure in acknowledging and welcoming our many guests and visitors. Due to the lengthy list of visitors that we have tonight, also returning um, visitors that have studied with us before, although I will not be able to acknowledge you individually, I want you to really take this as a personal welcome and acknowledgement. So will all our visitors please stand.
we do want to remind those of the Dallas-Fort Worth area that we do have a branch school located in this area and someone will contact you giving you the address. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Could we have the beginning of that scripture reading read again, please? Second Timothy, third chapter. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Okay, let's stop for a moment. When I first heard that scripture read, and it talked about perilous times coming. I thought about things like nuclear warfare and air pollution and Chernobyl. And yet when you read what Timothy has to say, he goes on to explain what he's talking about. And he wasn't talking about natural disasters. He wasn't talking about things that you and I might fear from a physical standpoint. Reread his list. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now all those things, and he goes on, Timothy says are the perilous things we need to worry about. And that's why we have found ourselves down here in this teaching. Whether we realize it or not, we came in the door because we were looking for something that the world could not give us. We couldn't find peace. We couldn't find stability. We couldn't find answers. And we saw things like that around us and maybe in us, and we wanted something that could help that situation. So. The people who are gathered in this room will have the same testimony that I have. They found something here that they couldn't find in the world. Now, I'm not going to have it read, but I would appreciate it that if I call a scripture that we don't take the time to get, that you make a note and you check it out for yourself when you have a chance later. Psalms 33 and 6, it says that wisdom and knowledge shall be your stability and the strength of your salvation. Now, we're in a time of the world, the last century, where there has been more knowledge than there has been since the beginning of time. And yet this world is less stable, less secure, and less peaceful than it has ever been. So obviously, when the prophet was writing, he didn't mean man's knowledge and man's wisdom. That wasn't giving them peace of mind and it wasn't giving us peace of mind. So we came here. Now, what we have here is a teaching that a man named Henry C. Kinley claimed he was given in a divine vision and revelation in the year of 1931 from God. And you might think, well, that sounds a little bit crazy, or there's a lot of people talking about visions and revelations, or I'm a person of intelligence and I need information in order to understand something. Well, Dr. Kinley recognized that because his situation was a little bit different than all the other people who are asking you to believe them and follow them in this world. He said, I've been giving something from God, and I'd like to have you expect me to prove that. I want to give you knowledge and things that back up what I'm talking about. So when people come to this lecture, we don't ask them to leave here and to go home and to just accept what we've said. In fact, we'll be sorely disappointed if that's what happens. We also will be sorely disappointed if you leave 
and just reject what you've heard without checking it out because it works both ways. We're offering something that could be very, very important to you and we'd like you to at least give it a little bit of your time and attention so that if you accept or you reject, you do so intelligently. Now, the moderator talked about the names that are above this blackboard. You may or may not be familiar with the name Yahweh. It's in a lot of literature, in many, many Bibles that are published today, and it's acknowledged that this is the correct name. I have spoken with Jehovah Witnesses. I have read in their documents that even though they use the name Yahweh, I'm, excuse me, they use the name Jehovah, they acknowledge that Yahweh is the more correct name. But it would be the downfall of their faith in order to have to change over. So Yahweh is not an uncommon piece of information these days. Now there's more than meets the eye to that name Yahweh that we talk about in this class. It is not simply a group of letters up on this board. And I will be talking about some things and other speakers will also be talking about some things to let you know that there's importance in this name. We also use the divine title of Elohim, where in most of your Bibles you might see the title God. And the moderator explained that these are simply titles and if you do a little bit of checking in a dictionary or an encyclopedia, you will find that those are correct. Those are the original things that this more recent mistranslation came from. Now we also use the name Yahshua, which may or may not be familiar to your ears. I'm sure you've heard the name Joshua in modern day usage, and it is this name with the letter J substituted in the front. And there's a lot behind the scenes with this name Yahshua. Speakers already in this convention have gotten up and spent a long time showing you how the man Yahshua is not the same is who the world identifies as Jesus and the difference goes far beyond the name or the label that is put on that physical body. Now I want to do some talking about some things related to that tonight. But let's, let's start out with Romans 1, 19 and 20 so we can lay some ground rules. There are things that are the way we've been, ex we've been taught you can understand your Creator. So that when you leave here, there are ways that you individually and personally can understand your Creator. You do not have to rely upon someone else. You don't have to blindly follow someone else. And this is one of those things that you need to know, Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them. Now you may not have known that you could know something about your Creator. You may have come from a faith that told you that it wasn't possible to know much or anything until after you die. You may not have been encouraged to do things like read in the Bible or check out what other faiths teach. But Paul in Romans, and Paul is an accepted scholar by many of these religions, says that you can know something about your Creator. Now, read on. For Yahweh hath showed it unto them. And the reason you can is not because a man said so, but because Yahweh has showed it unto us. Read on. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, the invisible things of Yahweh. The moderator was explaining that Yahweh is spirit which we have illustrated on this chart by this cloud in the corner. And spirit is something that we cannot understand with our natural senses. Yahweh dwells in a realm that our physical senses cannot perceive. And those are the invisible things of Yahweh. All right, but what about those invisible things? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now, you can see invisible things. Doesn't that sound a bit contradictory? If something is invisible, it usually means you can't see it. And yet Paul says there are things about our Creator that are invisible, but you can see them. And you can see them, how? Being understood by the things that are made. Being understood 
by the things that are made. Now, he didn't say, by looking at them with your eyes. He said, being understood by the things that are made. And what organ do you use to understand things? You use your mind. So, in other words, there are ways that you can understand your Creator. And those things are taking the natural things, the things around us, and looking at them to tell us something about the one who made them. Now, you might still be thinking, but what if I don't understand the things that are made? What if I don't understand the human body? What if I don't understand the Bible? What if I don't understand physics or geology or baseball? All these things that are around us, we look at them through our eyes and they don't look like they tell us anything about the Creator. So obviously we need a little bit of assistance in order to be able to understand even the things that are made. Now, let's go into Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Read verse 2, I believe it is, and then skip down to around uh, 20 or 21. Hebrews 9 and 2. For in the first compartment of the tabernacle... All right, now, this verse is talking about a structure that was given to the Israelites some 3,500 years ago as a dwelling place for God at that time, for Yahweh who dwelt with them. And it goes in here and it starts to describe what this tabernacle looked like and what happened within it. Okay, so they're talking about the tabernacle. Now skip down to around 20 or 21. Verse 21. Moreover, he sprinkled likewise with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Okay, keep reading. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Keep reading. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Mm -hmm. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens... Now, talking about this tabernacle, and it says this tabernacle which was made is a pattern of things in the heavens. So when we take Romans 1, 19 and 20 and it says we can understand something about our Creator and we can do it by the things that are made, we now know we can help, we can see about the things that are made by this tabernacle because it's a pattern of the things in the heavens that we can't see. And speakers have gotten up and talked about this tabernacle and how, for example, it's a three-in-one structure. And they've taken things such as your physical body, something that we all have and are somewhat familiar with, and shown how you also are a three-in-one structure. This was a court roundabout, a holy place, a most holy place. You have an abdominal area, a chest area, and a head area. And those are the three main compartments or cavities that make up your three-in-one vessel. They've gone in and showed you how there was an altar on which sacrifices had to be offered up, and there was continual burning. It was a square altar and had points of blood. So in your court roundabout, or your abdominal area, we find you have intestines. And on those intestines, which are square in configuration, this is where all the food that you take in, or something innocent, a sacrifice that has to offer up its life for you to keep on living, that sacrifice gets consumed down here. There's a continual burning going on down here because you're continually digesting down here. There were four points of blood there. There were four um, areas of arteries that come into this intestine just like there were over there. Ashes had to be emptied out. Periodically, ashes have to be emptied out. Now, there's a lot of detail in here that I'm not going to take the time to get into. I just want to show you a few examples. But this pattern is explained in your Bible the 25th through the 40th chapter of Exodus. So you can go in and read and double check that we've accurately represented it. You can go into your body and see if you don't have an intestine that operates like that and looks like that. You can go in to your body and see that you have uh, aortic arch that comes off your heart. In here we had a seven branch lampstand which provided light during the hours of darkness. 
This aortic arch has seven branches coming off of it, and it's what pumps the oxygenated blood throughout your body. It pulsates. That pumping action is just like a pulsation. In fact, they call it a pulse. And this oxygenated blood is what provides the light for your body. So there's a seven-branch lampstand that provides light. There's a seven-branch aorta that provides light. We go into the most holy place, and we had an Ark of the Covenant, archangels on either side, a great cloud, and the law up here. We go into your most holy place, or your head cavity, and you have bone structure down here that's like a chest, and underneath it is the pituitary gland, which is called the master law for your body. There are archangels up here. There are hemispheres in your brain, gray and white cloud. The color of the matter in your brain is gray and white. This is where they're... Michael and, and Gabriel, the archangels dwell, you have motory or the action types of uh, responses in your brain, and you have sensory or the messages. Michael was the warrior, Gabriel was the messenger. And there are things that go on and on and on to show you the correlation between this pattern and this body. Speakers have showed you there's a three-in-one in your cell. There, you have a cell body, a nucleus, and no, nucleolus. In your atom, you have a proton, a neutron, and an electron. There is just no end to the things you can understand by this pattern. Now, what this pattern also does for you is it helps you understand the mind of your creator. He brought in this creation by this pattern. And so what you're seeing is a way to look at things around you just like we were talking about a few minutes ago, to take the things that are made to understand the things that you can't see. Now, the Bible is put together by the same pattern. You go in and you read in the stories of the Bible, and you start to see that there are certain things that repeat themselves. Bible scholars have pointed out that there's a lot of 40s in the Bible. If they understood the workings of this pattern, they might understand better why they're seeing certain ideas repeat themselves. Um, let's see. Why don't we get Luke 24:27? Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now this is Yahshua the Messiah talking. And he's explaining something about himself to two men that are walking with him after his death, burial, and resurrection. And he went back and referred to things written in Moses and in the prophets, which are the things written in the Old Testament of the book called the Bible, to explain things about himself. And the reason he did this is because there are a lot of things in the Old Testament of the Bible that are very, very important to understand what goes on later on in the Bible. We talk about Adam and Noah and the Israelites and the tabernacle, and then we get up to the Messiah. And if we came from the Christian faith, chances are that we did not use the Old Testament much. And yet if we come from the Hebrew faith, they discount the New Testament writings. The Messiah is showing us that we need both parts of the story in order to understand something about him. Now let's talk about some things that are in the Old Testament of the Bible and see if we can get a better understanding about the man we call, the man the world calls Jesus, who we have correctly told you is named Yahshua. Let's get, hmm, let's get John 145. John 145, 
John 1 and 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Yahshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Okay, now people at the time of the Messiah, they were waiting for a Messiah. Just like people in this day and age are looking for something that will be their salvation. And when these Israelites were waiting for their Messiah, because of the prophecies, they knew that the time was close. And these men said that they have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. And then they point him out as Yahshua of Nazareth. Now, what that means to us is that there's a way to go back in, into what's written in the scriptures, to find out for sure who the Messiah is. Now, that's important. Because if you're going to place your belief in anything, you want to be confident that you have the right thing. And they had been waiting a long time for their Messiah to come. So it was important that they got the right man. And if you read in historical records, there were other people who claimed to be the Messiah at the time Yahshua was walking on the face of the earth. Now, if you were an Israelite back there, how would you know who was the right person and who wasn't? If you're looking for salvation today, how are you going to know what is the right answer or the right place or the right thing? Everybody out there claims that they have something that will do you good. But you want to be sure, because what's at stake is your eternal life, that you have the right thing. Now, let's go into Moses in the law and what the prophets wrote to see if we can find out how we can identify our salvation. If we go back in, and this chart is a pictorial representation of some things that happened back with the Israelites. The bottom part represents Egypt, where they were held in bondage and where they dwelt for a while. The middle part is the wilderness of Sinai. The top part represents Canaan's land or modern-day Israel. Now, back in this story of the Israelites, which Moses wrote, so we're going back to Moses, there's a story about the people of Israel leaving Egypt and going on a migration trek. And there are a lot of things set up back here that if we look at, they help us to understand about the Messiah. Um, let's do one more thing before we do that. Let's get in Luke 24, where we were, let's go down to 44 and 45. Luke 24, 44. See, the problem with trying to explain how the thing really is, is that it is so different from the way we've been taught in the world that you don't even know where to start. We have to educate you to the correct names, to the fact that you can know about your creator, to the fact that there is a pattern in operation, as explained by this tabernacle and seen in your body and throughout the Bible and in science, and that the man called Jesus, that things are different than the way most of us have been taught. So I apologize if this sounds a little bit choppy. It's almost as if I've got so much food that I'd like to serve somebody for dinner, I don't even know where to start giving you to eat. Um, read. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you. Now this is the Messiah speaking again. This is something he said that he already told them, and he's repeating. Go ahead that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. All right, now he's saying that this is an important thing to know about him, 
that all things written in the law of Moses, now that's the first five books of your Bible, and in the Psalms and in the prophets, which is the rest of the Old Testament, they testify of him and he was fulfilling them. Now the word fulfill, if you look it up in a dictionary, means to finish, to end, or to complete. So in other words, he's saying that the things he's doing and the things he's saying are in fulfillment of things written from a long time before. So when we look at things related to him that we read about in what's called the Gospels, we should be able to recognize things from a while before, from Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. Because he's saying he's fulfilling them or finishing them, bringing them to an end. So if we go back here with Moses and we look at what happened back here with Moses, we have a group of people that were in bondage that are waiting to be delivered. Now didn't I just say a few minutes ago that at the time he came in, we had a group of people, the Israelites, who were waiting for their Messiah to come. They were also feeling as if they were in bondage. Now, they were living in Jerusalem or in Israel, but they were under Roman rule. And they didn't want to be under Roman rule. They wanted to be under, in their own land and independent. So they were a people, just as Israel was a long time ago, in a land under bondage waiting to be delivered. So the story that happens back here, and you can read about this in the book of Exodus, is that Yahweh sends a man called Moses down here to these Israelites, being held in bondage by the Pharaoh at the time, and gives them the gift of his name, or the information about his name, and says it is time for you to leave. But there are certain things that are going to happen before you can leave this bondage. And they went through various plagues that you can read about. And the last plague, the thing that happened that allowed them to leave bondage, was that a lamb had to be offered up. And this is known as the Passover, which the Hebrew people celebrate even until today. And in the course of this lamb being offered up, it had to be killed. Blood had to be drained out. Blood had to be put on the four points of the door in which these people lived. And then they waited for the death angel to pass over before they could leave Egypt. Now, we're going to go over here, and let's get John 129. And we're going to find out that somebody said something about this man that may sound a little bit strange, but if we knew about back there, we wouldn't think it was strange at all. All right? We're going to read about John the Baptist saying something about Yahshua. John 1 and 29. The next day John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh. Now, John pointed out this man as the Lamb of Yahweh. Now, if I were to ask you, does that look like a lamb, what would you say? From these eyes, looking at that man, he doesn't look like a lamb. But remember, in order to understand invisible or heavenly things, these aren't the organs that we use to look. We have to use this. And the way Yahweh's working his purpose, he said there's something about this man that's a lamb. Well, we talked about the lamb down there. Let's see if it looks like the same thing is happening. He comes in at a time that the people of Israel are in bondage to Roman rule, just like they were in bondage there. They were waiting for a Messiah. They had been promised that they would get out of that land. They would get out from underneath bondage, just as Israel was waiting for their Messiah. He comes in, and John points him out as a lamb. Now, knowing that story down there, your mind should click and say, a lamb. I bet you I know what's going to happen to this man. Now, if you read in the 12th chapter of Exodus, You're going to find out things like the lamb had to be a male of the first year. No spot had to 
I have no bones broken. I'm not going to continue writing those things. But when you go through the chapter, Exodus, the 12th chapter, you can list all these characteristics about this lamb. And you're going to find, you go in here and you look at this lamb. And this lamb is a male. Was taken out from the flock. Had to be checked over to make sure there was no spot or blemish. Now when John points him out as the lamb, for three years he's in what is called his ministry. And people are questioning him. People are testing him. They say things like, There's, you're different from us because you don't receive honor from men. He goes to Pontius Pilate at the end of his ministry when they want to offer him up. And Pilate says that there is no guile in him. What is, he, he says the truth. We find out that he's a lamb without spot and without blemish. In fact, when he gets baptized by John, John's used to asking people, have you sinned, and then putting them in the water. Yahshua came up to him, and you read in Matthew, and John says, you should be baptizing me, because he had no sin. He was a lamb with no spot and no blemish. Now, that lamb had to be killed back down in Egypt and offered up. This lamb had to be killed and offered up. In the process of the killing, the blood had to be drained out and put on the four points of the door. This lamb, when it was killed, you know that he was put up on the cross by the Romans. And there were people crucified on either side of him. And the Roman soldiers came around because they wanted to get the bodies off the cross so that they were coming around and breaking the legs of the people, hanging up there so they would die quicker. They came to him. He had already given up the ghost, so they chose not to break his legs. Why? Because if you read in the 12th chapter of Exodus about that lamb down there, it couldn't have any bones broken. Now, the Roman soldiers didn't know why they changed their mind, but Yahweh had a purpose and a plan set up. That pattern that he's going by to help you understand what's in his mind said no bones of the lamb can be broken. So they come to him. They can't break his bones, but they do pierce him in the side because the lamb had to be pierced somehow as it was killed back there. Now the blood that was draining out of this lamb had to make four points of blood on the door. Now again, we're not going to get it read, but in John 10, 9, it says, I am the door, and it's this man talking. Now, if I asked you with these eyes, does he look like a door? You would say no. And yet again, with, with the way Yahweh set his purpose up, we've got to look beyond what we can see with these eyes, and we find out that he was acting as a door unto salvation. It says, in continuing on in that chapter of John, that by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He will receive life more abundantly. So he was a door unto salvation for those people. And the blood, if you look at the way he was on the cross, you've got a nail in this hand, a nail in this hand, and nails in his feet, plus the crown of thorns around his head. So you've got one, two, three, four points of blood on this door from the blood of that lamb, just like you had down in, down in Egypt. Now, when this lamb was killed, Israel then left Egypt under cover of darkness and traveled for three days till they came through the Red Sea. So they were, after the death, they were in a, a burial and a transition period for three days. When he was taken off the cross, he was put into a tomb. And it says that three days later, he resurrected, or he came out of that transition period. And you'll find that principle of burial all the way through your pattern. After that lamb was killed and we were buried for three days, we resurrected and came into the wilderness of Sinai, according to this pattern back here. And they dwelled in this wilderness of Sinai for about 40 years. So this lamb dies, gets buried, resurrects on the third, 
And then when he comes up, he tarries on the earth plane for a period of 40 days before he resurrects. And during that time period, it says that he showed them many infallible proofs about things. When they were wandering in this wilderness for 40 years, Yahweh was showing them many infallible proofs about the way things were. Some believed and some didn't. And then after that resurrection and tarrying for 40, he then ascended into heaven. And then you read about the day of Pentecost, which it says the knowledge and the promise of what those people had been waiting for was poured out. So after Israel wandered in here for 40 years, they resurrected into the promised land or what they had been waiting for. And the land came into fruition and they were given their inheritance. So we can see how by looking at this story back here, all of a sudden we realize that it's not just a nice story written in the Bible, or it's not just nice history of a people called the Hebrews, but it's a prophecy or an institution or a foretelling so that we can know that this man truly was the Messiah. Now, it's important that we have a way to recognize our salvation. I started off by saying that we do live in perilous times. Not so much a salvation from the threat of nuclear war, but a salvation from all those things that are going on in here in people out in the world. You look around you at current events, and you see things like um, the, the hearings with Contragate and, and the North right now. And it makes you really wonder about what goes on up in those upper echelons of the people who run this country. Makes you feel very unsafe as to what kind of decisions are going to get made. You look at things about, say, Wall Street and with the economy, and you find out that they're concerned about the ethics of the new generation coming into Wall Street into high finance makes you worry about what the economy and what your pocketbook is going to be like in another couple of years. Then you hear things about what happened with Oral Roberts or Jim and Tammy Baker. And it makes you wonder about the people that the world is looking to for their spiritual leadership. You see things about the up-and-coming political candidates, like Gary Hart, and it was proved that he had the wrong heart. He wasn't an acceptable candidate to run this government. Now, that was just a type and a shadow, but all those things are indicators for you that times are getting even more perilous. Now, if that's the case, how are you going to get saved? How are you going to find a way out of that? How are you going to know your salvation when it gets here? Or when you get here? You're going to have to know and understand how your creator is working his purpose, which you can do by this pattern. Now, it's a real concern because all the way through the, the purpose of Yahweh, whenever the salvation to the world has been presented, people have missed it. You take the story of Noah in the ark. You're familiar with that. It is not just another Bible story. There is a lot in there to be learned, important for you to understand. And the man Noah was given a vision 120 years before the perilous times were going to come to an end. Because men were lovers of their own selves, truth breakers, greedy at that time also. And the gospel had to be preached in that world before the end could come. Noah went around and was preaching for 120 years. And part of what he was doing, besides telling people that if you do not change the way that you are, you're going to die, he was building an ark. And people looked at that man. He was not a young man. And they looked at this boat. It had never rained before. Don't you think they thought Noah was a little bit strange? That isn't what they would have want if they were picturing in their mind what salvation would have looked like. 
It was not Noah and his boat. When you look at Israel, who was waiting for a Messiah, when Moses came wandering down here, an 80-year-old man had been out with sheep for 40 years, couldn't talk very well, and you would have walked up with a microphone and pulled the Israelites on the street and said, what do you expect your Messiah is going to look like? Do you think they would have described Moses? When Yahshua was on the earth plane, it talks about him in the Bible, and you find out that he was not comely to look at. That he came from, he was the son of Joseph, of Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? It says so in your scriptures. He had so many strikes against him, there was no way they wanted to believe him. And so you read that by the time it got down to the end, there were very few people that stuck around with him and truly believed that he was the Messiah they were waiting for. Now, if that's the purpose and plan that Yahweh has been operating under, if that's the pattern that we see, what makes us think it's going to be any different now? If you come in here and this is your first or second time and you look at these charts, you probably reacted the way I did. This is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It also is not the best artwork I've ever seen before. And it's got pictures of things that I never thought about before. But there is something here that keeps you thinking about stuff, keeps you coming back. I'll tell you, one of the first classes I went to, somebody stood up on the floor and said that everything I ever thought in my whole life was wrong. Now, if somebody had asked me if I was, gonna, if I was looking for something and I was going to describe what that salvation looked like, it certainly wasn't somebody who was going to tell me that everything I ever thought in my life was wrong. And yet we keep coming back here. So there's got to be something that you don't see initially with these eyes and hear initially with these ears that can do something for you in these perilous times. Now, let's go back to what we were talking about with this Messiah. You're going to find out that something very important did happen when this man walked upon the face of the earth. Let's get, let's see here. Let's get Jeremiah 31, 31. There are things that you have not been told that you so vitally need to hear. And I would ask you to take it with a grain of salt if it looks and sounds different than what you thought your salvation would look and sound like. Because we have been fooled by our first impressions before. And listen to what your creator is offering. I've been sitting in this convention thinking that it's like a smorgasbord that you go to. And you're able to walk along the table, and you might not like all kinds of food, but there's this massive array of food that you can pick things from to put on your plate, like a big salad bar or something like that. And you listen to all the speakers in here, and everybody's from different backgrounds and expresses themselves differently and has different things that show them Yahweh's purpose. But all that food is, it's all important. It's all tasty. It's all good for the spiritual man. It all helps you build your spiritual body. And so we need, have you ever noticed that when you go to somewhere different, how we order everything that we eat at home when we go to these places? You can get like, I don't know, Cajun food or Texas steak or something, and we still, and we, go, we order our cheeseburgers. <laughs> We're afraid to try something new. Why? You might find something you like. So at this banquet, we've got to be careful that we don't just outright reject some of these different kinds of food because it doesn't look like our cheeseburger. Yahweh is a master chef and can cook something so that it looks different every time we hear it. And yet it's got all those essential nutrients that we need in our body.
All right, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, this is very important. We're reading about something that was written before the man, Yahshua, came upon the face of the earth. And in talking with people, he keeps saying he's finishing things. Now, if we go back into things that were written in the prophets, Yahweh says, Behold, the days are going to come when I will make a new covenant. Now, automatically, that lets you know that there was at least one old covenant. Because you don't make something new if you haven't already had something old. Okay, read on. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, this new covenant is not going to be like the one that he made when he brought their fathers out of Egypt. So this tells us what the old covenant was all about. It was the one that was given back here at Mount Sinai. Now, this is part of that migration trek we were talking about. They were in here for 40 years, and while they were in here, they were given a covenant that consisted of the Ten Commandment Law plus various other ordinances that Yahweh made with their fathers. He's saying this new one is not going to be like the old one. Read on. Which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. And if you read about it, they weren't obedient to anything that they had agreed to do. Read on. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. Now, listen up, because this is very important. What you should be thinking, if you're at all familiar with things in the Bible or religion teaches you, is that there, down through the ages, Yahweh has worked different things with different people. And what Jeremiah is saying here is that there's going to be a change in the covenant or the agreement Yahweh has made with mankind. Now, you should immediately be thinking, where does that leave me? What covenant or what agreement with Yahweh am I under right now? Because you'll find that the expectations under those covenants are very different. Okay, read on. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Now, the promise of this new covenant is that the law of Yahweh or those things that Yahweh has to offer us are going to be written in our hearts and in our minds. Back here, they were written on tables of stone and put into this building called the tabernacle. They were not inside the people, they were inside a building. Now, in these perilous times, if you have that law of Yahweh in your heart and in your mind, don't you think that that will help give you the peace and the stability and the things that you need to survive that awful list that's at the beginning of the scripture reading? Now, when you read through this scripture a little bit longer, it tells you that it, it says that there's going to be an old, a new covenant and we need to know when the Old Covenant ends. Now, if you go back in, you'll find out again. Check this out. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says that Yahweh has declared the end of something right from the beginning. This covenant came in, or the beginning of this Old Covenant came in with the death of that lamb, the burial for three days, then the journey to Mount Sinai that we were talking about. So, we're going to know the end of the covenant when we also see the death of a lamb, a burial for three days in the tomb, a resurrection, and then 50 days later, an outpouring of a covenant or an agreement with the people. 50 days after this man resurrected was the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost signaled a new time or a new covenant for mankind. Now, I'm sorry that I don't have a lot of time to go in and finish that up, but the thought I'd like to leave you with is if we have missed, if, if the world has missed Yahweh's salvation so many times, and we don't want to do that, the reason they've missed it is because it's never looked the way they wanted it to look then if what the world is telling you you need to do now for salvation no matter what it be, works of righteousness, going to church every Sunday, donating money to, to the preacher that comes across the TV screen, no matter what you're told is necessary for your salvation now, 
you want to rethink that because you do not want to miss your salvation. And it's very possible that everything we ever thought in our whole life was wrong. This organization can help you start a new road so that you can learn everything that is right. So I appreciate your, your listening, your attention. And I ask you to come and study with us again so that you can hear a lot more information about all those things Yahweh has given us to give to you. Because it's very important, but it also gives you that joy and that peace and that stability that you're looking for. Thank you. The California State Officers Board, Dr. Wallace Blanchard. Good evening. And I'm always happy and glad to be able to give a reasonable testimony to the things that I've been blessed to know since coming into this school. And again, we do like to emphasize that this is a school and this is not a church. And we come down here to learn something definite, something absolute, something that's irrefutable and infallible concerning our Heavenly Father. Yahweh. And for us to learn something irrefutable and infallible, we must be obedient to the things that he's laid down for us to attain or come to this knowledge and this understanding. And that is through his son, Yahshua, the Messiah. Now again, just to make mention that what you see before you is the result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the year of 1931 in Springfield, Ohio. So this is not something that we read upon or we thought upon, but it indeed came directly from the Heavenly Father to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. And one of the things that I can appreciate that he said was, don't believe me because I said I had a divine vision and revelation, but look, make me prove this to your satisfaction and to your understanding, you see? So we don't want to just say a lot of things and not have them proven to our satisfaction and to our understanding. And we do ask you to check out the things that you've heard thus far and check out the things that you may hear. Now, when we go back and look at what it is that we need to know about our Creator through His Son, Yahshua the Messiah, we must realize the importance, see, the importance of a divine vision. Now, you've heard the speakers talk about this tabernacle pattern. You've heard them talk about the name. You've heard them talk about the things that the Creator has asked the man to build. But what I want you to realize is all of this came by way of a divine vision and revelation. When we look at this man, Moses, or Noah, being instructed on how to, con how to build this threefold ark of safety for the people that he preached that it was going to rain. See, this came by way of a divine vision and revelation. And one thing you want to notice about this man, Noah, see, it says he was upright in his generation. In other words, now during the time of Noah, the world had waxed wicked, see, just like it is today. And what the Creator is doing is showing mercy today like he did back here with Noah. And this is what I mean. In other words, Yahweh has always given the man an opportunity to be warned, see, of what he's about to do in terms of destroying uh, uh, the wicked. So what he did, he raised up this man Noah and had him preach to the wicked. Now that's who he was preaching to. And somebody say, well, well 
Who was that? Well, that was everybody. See, wasn't no, he didn't miss nobody. See, look, when Dr. Kinley came in, see, he's got to do the same thing. See, preach to the wicked, those who don't have a knowledge and understanding, and those who are going about to establish, see, their own righteousness. You see? Now, look, and let me just say this about, about the church world or the Christian world. Let me have Romans, uh, the 10th chapter again. We had that read once, but let's have that read again. See, we know that the world, see, and we was in that world at one time. We know that the world has a zeal for their creator. But the problem is their zeal is not according to knowledge. Read, please. Romans 10 and 1. Mm -hmm. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to Yahweh for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, this is the apostle Paul, and he's saying that his heart's desire and prayer to Yahweh for his brother in Israel is that they might be saved. Read. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of Yahweh. For he bears them record. In other words, there's something they are doing that, that he can look at to show forth that, see, that, they, he, he's, that he noticed they are bear, that they are zeal, zealous toward their creator. Read. But not according to knowledge. But it was not according to knowledge. See? In the Christian world is in the same situation. They have a zeal of their creator, the one they call God or Jehovah or whatever you see. But the problem is, it's not according to knowledge, see. Now we know that you're going to have to have a knowledge of Yahweh. And it's not going to be your knowledge, it's going to have to be the knowledge that he has given. Uh, let me have Ephesians uh, about 1 in 14 or 1 in 17. Ephesians 1 and 17, that the yell of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now look, this is what it's going to take, folks. It's going to take none less than the spirit of Yahshua the Messiah to give us the wisdom and the revelation, read, in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. Keep reading. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now that's what the uh, uh, speaker previous to me was saying. Not your physical eyes, but the eyes of your understanding. See, there's more than just your 2020 natural vision. See, you have spiritual vision. See, and that's what we're dealing with. Read. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Not that you may guess or speculate, but that you might know these things. Read. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the Son. Mm -hmm. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. See, now what I'm, what I'm saying when I go back and talk about the Christian world is, see, they have not received this spirit of Yahshua the Messiah. See, there is another spirit in operation. Now... When we, when we go back like the, first, like the previous speaker said, see, in other words, now, Yahshua the Messiah has given us a way to come to that knowledge and understanding. Let me have John 5 and 39. John 5, 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Now, here's the Messiah speaking, and he's saying, see, to those Jews, Ye search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. See, now the question is, well, what are the scriptures that he was referring to when he told them, ye search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life? Well, the scriptures that Yahshua the Messiah was referring to was those 39 books, see, from Genesis to Malachi. The books from uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on down to Revelation had not been written at the time he spoke this. So when he was telling the religious leaders of his day, or the Jews of his day, to search the scriptures, now he didn't say read the scriptures. There's a difference between searching and reading. See, and then when, and he's being very specific about what he's telling them. See, I could say search Dallas. But if I don't tell you what to search Dallas for, what, you have no way of knowing what you're looking for. See, but he said search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, but the scriptures, they are they that testify of me. 
See? Now, if I'm in Dallas and I give you a description of myself and I say, search Dallas for me, and you know what I look like, and there's been some clues given by what you may find me out here in Dallas, see, then that's what the Savior is doing when he says that the scriptures testify of him. You see? So now, remember, the scriptures are not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that the Savior was referring to. Read on some more, please. But you will not come to me that you might have life. Now, this is where we're going to have to come to. We must come to Yahshua the Messiah if we are to have life. Read. I receive not honor from men. Read. But I know you that you have not the love of Elohim in you. Read. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. Now, look. The world says the Savior's name is Jesus Christ. They call the Creator Lord and they call him God, and then they call the Savior Jesus Christ. They don't have a name for the Holy Spirit. But now here, if you read in King James Version, it says that this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, I come in my Father's name. Well, Lord is a title, and God is a title. So you see, Jesus is really not coming in his Father's name. So that statement wouldn't be true if you're reading it out of the King James. See, but when you read it out of the Holy Name, Yahshua the Messiah said, I am come in my Father's name. Well, the question would be, what is the Father's name that he's coming in? See, let me have Exodus 3, 13 through 15. Exodus 3 and 13. Mm -hmm. And Moses said unto Elohim, uh -huh. Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel. Now, Elohim is not a name. This is a divine, pluralistic title that our Creator chose for himself. Now, remember, Moses, as a result of killing the uh, uh, Egyptian and burying him in the sand, and he's knowing that... Uh, uh, Pharaoh would seek his life. He fled up out of here for fear of his life into the wilderness, and he became a shepherd of Jethro Ruel. And at this time, he's uh, uh, on the backside of the mountain, see, after a period of 40 years, and the Creator appears to him, see, by way of a divine vision. And he is commissioning Moses to come back down into Egypt and bring the children of Israel up out of bondage. But Moses got a few things he want to get straight before he goes back down here because he knows he has killed a man. He's not going back down here and he got somebody waiting on him because he's killed a man. So, see, he want to get some things straight. So the Creator uh, talks to him and then he say, well, look, when I go back down into the children of Israel, now this is what the children of Israel are going to ask me. Now, look, they, these people down here had more sense than we have because at least they, Moses knew they would ask for a name. We never, never thought to ask for a name. We, were just, we just accepted Lord and God as being uh, the name of our creator, see? But here's some ignorant, unlearned people in bondage, see? Down here are going to ask Moses when he come down here, well, who sent you, Moses? What's his name? So Moses asked God, see, for a name, see? Now, I never was told or heard of anybody talking about Moses asking God for a name, you see? So Moses asked the creator for a name, and this is the name that the creator gives Moses. Now, the creator at this point in time has not revealed his, his name to mankind for some 2,513 years. In other words, from Adam down to Moses, the name of Yahweh had not been known to no man. Read. And Moses said unto Elohim, uh -huh. Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? Now they're going to say to me, What is his name? Read. What shall I say unto them? I read. And Elohim said unto Moses, Aya, Asher, Aya. Now Elohim says to Moses, Aya, Asher, Aya. Now, now Aya, Asher, Aya, that is not a name. See, don't let nobody tell you that's a name. You see? Yahweh has given Moses a, 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 a description or a characterization of himself first. Then he goes on to give him the name. Read. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be, hath sent me unto you. Read. And Elohim said moreover unto Moses. Now Moses, in addition to you telling them, I, I am, I will be, has sent you unto them, you also tell them this. Read. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of Jacob has sent me unto you. Now look, Moses, you tell them that Yahweh, the Elohim, the 
being put in front of this lets you know right away this is not a name. See, you don't say the Yahweh no more than you would say the Robert Harris. See? But now you do say the Lord. Why? Because that's not a name. See, there are many, many lords. You got your landlord. See, you got a whole bunch of lords over in uh, England. See, you got warlords in China. See, you got many gods. See, and the apostle Paul having the Holy Spirit in him. See, he stated this in 1 Corinthians 8 uh, uh, and 5, how that there are lords many and that there are gods many. See, but now Yahweh, see, this is the name that he gave to Moses. And what we want to do now is find out how long did he give this name as being his name. Read. This is my name forever. Look, how long? Forever. How long is that? Without end. See, this is my name forever. Not until the J come in, see, and you want to change it, see, to Jehovah. See, but the name Yahweh is his name forever. Not only is it his name forever, but it's a, me a memorial. Now, a memorial is something you keep in memory. This is my memorial, read. Unto all generations. Not just the generation of the Jews, see, but it's to all generations. Now, you've heard of the Washington Memorial in Washington and the Lincoln Memorial. See, those are memorials of those men, you see. Now, Yahweh, see, there's a lot of things he could have told a man to keep in memory, see. Um, uh, a lot of things he could have had the man memorialize him as. See, but he said, look, all I want you to do, see, is do something real simple. Just keep my name in memory. And see, the man hasn't been able to do that, you see. Because all the time, Yahweh has to always come back and have his name declared unto the people, you see. So look, Moses gets the name Yahweh, see, out here, see, in the wilderness. And look, folks, remember how Moses is communing with his creator. He's communing with his creator in a vision. So this great name of Yahweh didn't come by natural means. See, this name wasn't given, see, naturally so. See, it was given by way of a divine vision, see, and revelation, see. And when you go on down to the prophets, see, even the David in the psalmist said, Thy name, O Yahweh, is forever in a memorial to all generations, you see. And when Yahshua the Messiah comes on in, see, through the loins of the Virgin Mary, see, then he says, I have declared thy name to the men that I, thou hast given me out of the world. And then when Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley comes on in, see, then he got to do the same thing all over again, see, because mankind just refused to be obedient to keep this name, see, in, re in remembrance, see. And keep in mind, the man didn't just do this in and of himself. He has a lot of help to be disobedient to Yahweh. I'm talking about that other spirit, see. But yet and still, at the end of the age, see, Yahweh sent forth a man, see, that brought us the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You see, now look, the Messiah spoke about, listen, he spoke about how the days would be at the end of this age. He said, so was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, see, at the end of this age. See, so when we go back and see what went on with Noah, remember, the people had waxed wicked at this time. Now, if you check out the world today, you'll see mankind's mind, see, is wicked at this time. But now watch what Yahweh does with Noah. He tells Noah, see, to build this ark, see, but he also tells Noah, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to preach, see. He tells Noah he's going to have to preach to the wicked, and Noah's obedient, he does that. He gets the blood off of his head, see, and he put it on the wicked head, see. You go down to the prophet Jonah, you find out that city Nineveh was a wicked city. But what did he have to go there and do? He had to go there and preach so those people could have a possibility of repenting or changing their mind. These people back here with Noah had, the, had a possibility or a chance of changing their mind, but they didn't. But yet and still, Yahweh gave them that opportunity. Now you come on down here to where we are, see? You find out the Great Commission from Yahshua the Messiah, see? Right before he took off the flesh, he told those apostles, see, all 11 of them, he said, go ye therefore in all the world and do what? Preach, uh, teach, see, to all the people. See, why? See, so that I'm giving them warning, I'm giving them a chance to repent or change their mind. See, now evidently he wanted them to teach about his death, burial, and resurrection because that wasn't being done at that time, you see. So what I'm saying is this, here we are. 1931, what they preaching about? 
preaching about Jesus and I since he got baptized, you got to get baptized. He ate Lord's Supper, you eat Lord's Supper. He hung on the cross, well, you don't have to do that one. See? But uh, we will accept money. See? So now look. Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, he comes in in the year of 1931. What he does, he preached the true, genuine gospel of the kingdom. See? And how was he able to do that? Because he had a divine vision and revelation. How was, how was Noah able to preach? Because he had a divine vision and revelation. How was Jonah able to preach? Because he had a divine vision and revelation. How was those boys, when Joshua sent them out to preach, how was they able to preach? Because they had a divine vision and revelation. So look, when Dr. Kinley come in, see, can't preach until he has a divine vision and revelation. See, and we thought he was, and, and even the people who, even his own family and people who knew him in that little church, they just thought he was such a great preacher. But he wasn't preaching because he had not had the divine vision and revelation. All he done was saying words. But look, once he had the divine vision and revelation, he out of his own mouth said, look, that Bible became, see, as a, 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 in other words, the words didn't change, but my understanding changed. See, in other words, he would look at that 24th chapter of, uh, uh, of Matthew, see, and he'll, it'll read, why don't we read that? So I can uh, show you what he, what he said about that, that scripture. Matthew 24. Uh, 28, 19, read. 28, 19. Uh-huh. Matthew 28 and 19. Go ye therefore uh -huh. and teach all nations. Read. Baptizing them in the name now of look, the Father. Now look, it says clearly they are baptized them in the name of the Father. See, but Dr. Kinley said before he had the divine vision and revelation, this is what he saw there. And he wasn't by himself and alone when he saw water there. See, baptized in the water. That's what they interpreted that as being. But once he had his divine vision and revelation, see, then he realized it says, it didn't say W-A-T-E-R, but it did say N-A-M-E. Baptized in the name. See, now you have, see, <laughs> and the way he can understand that so clear, because now he's finally been given names. See, he's been given the name of the Father, Yahweh. Been given the name of the Son, Yahshua. Been given the name of the Holy Spirit, Yahshua. See, but before he had his divine vision and revelation, baptize, I baptize thee, my beloved brother, in the name of the Father, Kedusha. Well, what was the name? I baptize my beloved brother in the name of the Son. Well, what was the name? In the name, baptize thee, my beloved brother, in the name of the Holy Spirit. But you never got a name. You see? But look, after he received this stupendous divine vision and revelation then came with the name. Just like Noah, see, when the vision came, the name came. See, down here with Dr. Kinley, the vision came, the name came. You see, so what I'm saying is to you, especially you new people, now that you see the divine vision, don't you recognize that the name comes with the vision? And look, it's not coming because of our own volition. See, it's coming because this is how it's been all the way down through the ages and dispensations. See, but again, with this man Moses, and then you go all the way on down through the prophets, see, and on down to Yahshua the Messiah, see, and that's what he said in John 5 and 43. He said, I am come. Didn't say I'm going to come or I have come. I am come present tense in the name of the Father. See, and look, <laughs> if you read, read, John, uh, read John 12 and 12. See, well, look, it was more than Joshua said he came in the name of his, his, his father. The other people realized that. John 12, 12. Mm -hmm. On the next day, Joshua went out and came to the Mount of Olives, and the multitude that were come to the feast, when they heard that he was coming to Jerusalem, uh -huh. took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of Yahweh. Well, are you, are you reading that right? Read that again. See, we don't want you to think Yahshua was the only one that said he's coming in his father's name. There's other people know that. They said, blessed is the king that come in the name of who? Yahweh. You see that? Look, so what I'm saying is this. We're going to have to understand, see, this great divine vision and revelation that our founder had in these names see, that he brought unto us, see, and that's what makes the vision complete, you see. Now look, now you was in John 540, 543, I want you to read on down to 540, 
Read 543. Start at 543 again. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. Now watch. Now we went to Exodus the third chapter to see where the name was given to Moses. See, and the name that was given was Yahweh. And this was his name forever. See, and his memorial unto all generations. So the Father's name did not change, see, 1,490 years later when Yahshua the Messiah came through the lawns of the Virgin Mary. See, so Yahshua the Messiah said, I come in my Father's name. Well, see, now right here we have Yah underlined in red showing the masculine form of the Father's name in principle. See, and then you see the same thing, Yahshua, who was a male child, see, he picks up the masculine portion of the Father's name. Now, sure, see, in Hebrew is salvation. So he said he came in his Father's name. So you got Yahshua, you got Yahweh. So you can see he did indeed come in his Father's name. You see? Now, you look at your president, his name is Ronald Reagan. See? But now you ought to know if, he, if he's come in his father's name, then his father's name has to be old man Reagan somebody. See? You see, the, you see Reagan and Reagan, just like you see Yah and Yah. You see? So what I'm showing you is just like it says in Romans 1, 19 and 20, take the natural thing to understand, see, the spiritual thing. See? So now Yahshua, Yah, and Yah. See? And we got that underlined for you. See? to show forth that he did come in his father's name. Now let's say another thing about this, this great name of Yahshua. Now, when we go back and search the scriptures, like he said in John 5, 43, he said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. See, the scriptures are going to even testify down to his name. You see? So now, we want to look at, we see how Yahweh's name came in, it came in by way of a divine vision. Is that right? Now, if Yahshua is coming in his father's name, let's see how his name comes. Let's see if somebody gives him his name ordinarily or is there something special about his name when it comes in. Let me have, uh, back in the scripture, let me have Genesis, the uh, 17th chapter, and about the 17th verse. Somebody else go down and get me... Uh, Get me Kings 22 and, and about 8. Genesis 17, 17. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Now look, Yahweh told Abraham that his wife Sarah was going to conceive in her old age. Now Abraham just knew this just couldn't be. So he fell up on his face and laughed at that. He just thought that was funny. See? <laughs> So he started late, he didn't even try to hide it from Yahweh. He just opened with what he was doing. He just knew that was the funniest thing he had heard. He just fell right before Yahweh and just started laughing. See, if you read about Sarah, see, she tried to hide her laughter. But this thing was just so funny to Abraham, he couldn't hide it. He just started laughing right there in front of Yahweh. See? <laughs> read. And said in his heart, Shall a son be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Now he said this within himself. Look, how can I have a son? I'm a hundred years old. Read. And shall Sarah, that is 90 years old, bear? Now, not only is he thinking about himself, <laughs> he's saying even my wife Sarah, he's got a lot to laugh at. He's laughing at himself, he's laughing at his wife, because both of them are old and past childbearing. Look, folks, this is a phenomenal thing that we're reading about. Read. <coughs> and Abraham said unto Elohim, O that Ishmael might live before thee. Mm -hmm. And Elohim said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son. Now look, Yahweh Elohim told Abraham, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son. Read. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. Now who is Abraham talking to? He's talking to Yahweh. Yahweh said that Abraham would have a son, and Yahweh said what Abraham's son would be named. In other words, the name came forth from the mouth of Yahweh, that named the son. So what I'm showing you is, look, Yahweh named Isaac, not Abraham. See, because Abraham didn't even know he was going to have a son. He's laughing about what Yahweh said. The furthest thing from his mind was having a son. See, but Yahweh told him he was going to have one and told him what he was going to name him. So Yahweh named Isaac. See, are you with me? All right, go on down to... Uh, Chronicles uh, tw 22 and uh, about 8. Now that's in the law with, 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 uh, with, with Isaac. 
and his son. Now we're going to go see what David and his, his son is all about. First Chronicles 22 and 8. But the word of Yahweh came to me saying. Now look, this is David rehearsing with Solomon how the deal went down. See, and he says the word of Yahweh, this is the word of Yahweh right here, this super incorporeal shape and form known as uh, Yahweh Elohim. It says this is what came to him. And this is what it said. Read. Thou hast shed blood abundantly uh -huh. and hast made great war. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name. See, in other words, David wanted to build a house to Yahweh, but Yahweh told David, you can't do that because you've been a man of war. You've shed much blood. Read. Because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Read. Behold, a son shall be born to thee. Does this sound close to what we read in the law? He says, behold, a son, not a daughter, a son shall be born unto thee. Read. Who shall be a man of rest. Now he's going to be a man of rest. Read. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. Uh-huh. For his name shall be Solomon. For his name shall be Solomon. Who told David that his, he's going to have a son and his name shall be Solomon? The same one that told Abraham he was going to have a son and his name would be Isaac. See? So now you come on down to... John, I'm talking about this, well, let's do it this way. You could, see, when you go to Luke, the first chapter, see, you find out there's a man officiating in the temple named Zechariah, and him and his wife was beyond childbearing. See, and when the angel appeared unto Zechariah, see, and told him what the situation was, because, see, they were beyond childbearing, they didn't have any children, see, says how that he would have a son, See, Zachariah didn't believe that so much so that he was just, his speech, his speech was taken away from him because he, he, didn't, he didn't believe what was going to happen. See, but this angel appeared, I'm talking about Gabriel, and you got it pictorial here, right here on the vision. See, Gabriel appeared to Zachariah, the high priest in those days, and told him he was going to have a son and what, his, what the son would be called. If you have that, uh, read it, please. That's Luke, first chapter. Uh-huh. Uh, starting at about... Verse 13. Mm -hmm. But the angel said unto him, well, start at verse 12. And when Zechariah, 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of Yahweh standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Stop. Now, so you don't get confused by saying, well, look, it was Yahweh and it was the word and it's an angel. We want you to understand the directive is all taking place from Yahweh. See, it says this angel came forth from who? Yahweh. From Yahweh. And what message was he carrying? Not the angel, message of Gabriel himself, but he's carrying the message of Yahweh. See, that's his job, is to take Yahweh's message, see, and deliver it to whoever he was supposed to deliver it to. And he's delivering it unto Zechariah. So that's why the angel appeared unto Zechariah, to give him a message from Yahweh. Read. And when Zechariah saw, uh -huh. he was troubled, and fell, fear fell upon him. Uh -huh. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah. Don't be scared, Zechariah. Read. For thy prayer is heard, uh -huh. and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, uh -huh. and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt call his name John. See, and Gabriel stands in the presence of Yahweh. See, and he was the one, see, through Yahweh sent Gabriel to tell Zechariah he was going to have a son and what he was to call the son. See, he couldn't be called Zechariah Jr. See, he's going to have to be called Yachanan in Hebrew, see, or John. See, now look, if the scriptures are testifying of Yahshua the Messiah, and you see how these names are coming down by the mouth of Yahweh, then watch what happened when his son comes in. All right, uh, Matthew 121. And she shall bring forth a son. Now look, <coughs> uh, before we get that, go back to Isaiah uh, 714. See, the scriptures are testifying beforehand the things concerning our Savior, Yahshua, the Messiah. Isaiah 7 and 14. Uh-huh. Therefore, Yahweh himself shall give you a sign. Uh-huh. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Now look, <clears throat> a virgin is going to conceive, read. And bear a son. And she's going to bring forth a son or a male child, read. And shall call his name Emmanuel. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means Elohim is with us. See, and when you come to understand the unity of the Spirit, you find out that Yahshua the Messiah was Elohim with them. See, now Matthew 1.21. 
and she shall bring forth a son. Now wait, it says she shall bring forth a son. See, but now if you read that, you'll find out that she that's bringing forth a son was a virgin. See, read. And thou shalt call his name Yahshua. Look, now this is, this is uh, 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 the angel that appeared unto uh, Joseph and Mary and said, and was telling Joseph at this point in time, to, look, go ahead, take your wife. See, because Joseph found out that she was a child. See, but he was concerned about how, how. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> I was just thinking real quick about uh, 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 Dr. Dewey McCoy. He used to always say, now how can these things be? See, so <laughs> here's Joseph thinking, now how can these things be? I know I haven't touched this woman. See, but yet and still she's pregnant. What's going on here? How can these things be? See, but look, it says with Yahweh all things are possible. See, that's how they can be. So look, <laughs> so... So here's, jo here's uh, Joseph, see, is trouble in his mind about the state and condition that Mary, his wife, is in. Read. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua. Now here the angel Gabriel appeals to Joseph <clears throat> and says, She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name what? Yahshua. You're going to call his name Yahshua. Now why in the world are you going to call his name Yahshua? Why aren't you going to call his name Joseph? Since uh, they said that was, uh, they said Joshua was Joseph and Mary's uh, uh, son. See, but we come to find out, no, that's really not the way it was. See, but you're going to call his name Joshua, colon. Now, colon is, uh, explanation is going to follow why you're going to call this son Joshua. Read. For he shall save his people from their sin. For he shall save his people from their sin. So Yahshua means that Yahweh is salvation. And what he's doing, he's manifested, see, to save his people from their sins. You see? So when we look at how Yahshua's name came down, see, it was no different from the way his father's name came down. And see, since he came in his father's name, and his father's name came by way of a divine vision, see, then Joseph talking to the angel, see, not flesh and blood, but by way of a divine vision, see, gets the name, see, of Yahshua the Messiah. And when you read this, what we read in the scriptures of Isaac, see, John the Baptist, See, and David, uh, Solomon, David's son Solomon, see, then their name came by a vision and by the mouth of Yahweh. See, so this is how the scriptures are testifying of our Savior, Yahshua, the Messiah. Now look, when we read down in John 5 and 46, Yahshua the Messiah still speaking to the religious leaders. See, well, before we do that, let, let, me, let me just do this right quick. Let me just, let me just uh, touch this right quick. In John 5, 43, now remember Joshua said he came in his father's name. But now, like Aaron Bryan was saying, we don't want to just leave that. We want to give it all to you. He said, now let another come in his own name. Him you will receive. Now Jesus is the, the one that's coming in his own name. Lord is a title. God is a title. Christ is a title. Here Jesus is coming in his own name. Now the one that spoke, Yahshua the Messiah, said, let another come in his own name, was the same one that said, let there be light, thus it was. See, so let another come in his own name, him you will receive. Now, you would have to admit to yourself, see, that the whole world has just about received Jesus, you see. But how many has received Yahshua the Messiah? Now, when you look at what's in this room, I'm talking about the 4,000 plus in this room compared to the world, it's just a remnant has received Yahshua the Messiah, showing forth, see, he was telling the whole truth when he said, let another come in his own name, him you will receive, you see. Now, he said in John 5, 46, see, let's read that, please. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. Now, look, he's telling those religious leaders, see, because they have trouble believing Yahshua the Messiah. And the reason they're having trouble believing Yahshua the Messiah, because... They didn't believe what Moses said. And look, folks, I'm going to tell you the same thing. You're going to have trouble believing Yahshua the Messiah if you don't go back and see what was it that Moses said about it. You're going to have to get Moses' record or account of what he said concerning your Savior. See, now if they had problems with understanding Yahshua the Messiah and they were contemporary to him, well, what about us down here, see, almost some 1,900 years after the fact? See, read. For he wrote of me. Now, Yahshua the Messiah clearly said that Moses wrote of him. 
See, and like we've said many times, if you can go back and show where Moses wrote anything, I'm talking about the first pen scratch about Jesus Christ, see, then we'll eat the Bible. See, now when you go back, you're going to go back and look or search in the first five books. See, we, we don't even tell you where to go look at. You search the first five books of your Bible, and if you can find anywhere where Moses made mention of anything concerning Jesus Christ, see, we'll eat the book. See, but you're not going to find it back there. You see, but you will find, see, one, Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, let me have Deuteronomy 18, 15. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Yahweh thy Elohim will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Now, here is Moses. See, the children of Israel have been out here in the wilderness, see, and Moses is getting ready to uh, uh, take off the flesh, and the children of Israel are going to go on over into Canaan's land. And he tells them this before he died. He said, now look, <coughs> Yahweh will raise up a prophet from among the midst of you. Now that right away lets you know, now if you do some research, you'll find out that Jesus is a concoction of, he, of Greek and Babylonian. But look, Moses already told you way back in the law how that Yahweh going to raise up the prophet like it unto him. Well, was Moses Greek and Babylonian? He was Hebrew. See? So look, that throw this name just right out of Kelter, right off the bat. See? Moses said Yahweh, would, thy Elohim, would raise up a prophet and going to raise him up right from among the midst of Israel, and he's going to be just like who? Just like Moses. Now, this is the thing you want to check out about this man, Moses, so you can see if Yahshua the Messiah is going to be fitting just like Moses. Moses knew the name of his heavenly father after he had the divine vision and revelation. Let me ask you this. Do you think Yahshua knew the name of his heavenly father? All right, so that's like Moses. Did Moses know the name? Moses knew the name. Did Yahshua know the name? Yahshua knew the name. Is that right? Moses, Yahweh, had Moses to deliver the children of Israel up out of bondage, you see? But now look what happened, see? Moses got to go back down here into Egypt, see? To deliver the children of, of, of Israel up out of bondage. Now let me ask you this question. When Moses went down here into Egypt to deliver the children of Israel up out of bondage, did Yahweh tell Moses something specific? I want you to read Exodus 3 and 12. We want to we wanna tighten up this Moses and this Yahshua to see if they are lack. Exodus 3 and 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee. Stop. Now was Yahweh with Moses? Was Yahweh with Yahshua the Messiah? Or, or, or was Yahweh, see, we, <laughs> we, for the sake of, under, for the, let me just say it this way to keep the continuity of thought. Yahweh was with Yahshua the Messiah, just like he was with Moses. You follow me so far? See, here's another key showing for when Moses said, Yahweh will raise up a prophet like it unto me. Now let me ask you this. Moses was a prophet? Was this man a prophet? Of course he was a prophet. And to show you he was a prophet, you try reading the 24th chapter of Matthew sometime. See, I'm saying prophet Moses, prophet Yahshua the Messiah. Look, Moses had the name, Yahshua had the name. Moses, look, when he came down here into Egypt, didn't he have the blueprint for them to get up out of here? In other words, he had a knowledge of how they could be delivered. Is that right? Did this man, when this man came in, did he know how to save these people? In other words, he had a knowledge. Moses had a knowledge of bringing them up out of Egypt, see, out of darkness. He has a knowledge of how to bring them up out of Egypt, out of darkness. What I'm trying to show you, folks, is look, the scriptures, it's just beautiful when you see this, how the scriptures are just no more than testifying to Yahshua, the Messiah, you see? So look, Moses goes down, see, and look, there's some demonstration of, of miraculous things going on with Moses before the children of Israel and Pharaoh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Did he have some demonstration of power before the scribes and the Pharisees and the children of Israel? I'm talking about with all the healings and the... The causing the blind to see and all of these. Uh, it, we can just go on and on. See, and even the prophets, when this same man here, see, was back there, told the sun to uh, stand still uh, uh, and the moon to be still in, uh, in the valley of Agilon. See, what I'm saying is, look, if Moses got some uh, 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 power, Yahshua 
has to have power. Now, when he was at this burning bush, see, Yahweh gave him some power signs to demonstrate to Pharaoh and to the children of Israel. See, showing forth when Yahshua come in, he must demonstrate power. You see, look, when this man came in, look, I'm just trying to show you, folks, the thing doesn't change. See, when the prophet came in, I'm talking about Henry Clifford Kenley, did he have some power? Did he know the name? Did he know how to bring us up out of darkness? Look, it just doesn't change. It's just the way it is. You see? And look, all of those who have a knowledge and understanding of Yahshua the Messiah, see, according to the scriptures, see, then they too, see, and I'm not talking physically so, but they too spiritually so can manifest some power to bring you up out of that chaotic uh, uh, condition that you're in today. You see? And that's what the sons are gathered here to do. Look, like you'll say at one of the other conventions, you see all these people here? They are not here for themselves. They are here for the new people. That's really what we're here for, for the new person. See, to let them see that, look, it's a great cloud of witnesses. See, and look, the only reason why we're here is because we've been uh, brought up miraculously, see, out of darkness, uh, out of that bondage, you see. So look, Moses, could he bring, could he come back down here and deliver the children of Israel before he got out first? See, in other words, you can't go help nobody else that you've been helped and you got the knowledge and understanding that you can go back and help somebody. See, so Moses couldn't go, couldn't help the people when he was down here. It was after he had went, got out, see, by who? By Yahweh Elohim, see, that he was able to come back down, see, and help them. Dr. Kenley couldn't do a thing for us when he was in the churches. See, he could heal you physically so, because he did have those healing powers before he uh, had the divine vision and revelation. But what good was that? That's just like Lazarus died, being called from the grave, and then got to go right back, you see? So Dr. Kinley couldn't do us no good, see, before he had the divine vision and revelation. But look, it was after he had been delivered that now he can deliver somebody else. See, and that's really the thing that we, we must see. See, get yourself delivered first. See, get Yahshua in you first. Then worry about the next guy. See, what? sometimes we get so worried about the next guy, we forget to worry about the guy that you have. You see? So look, get, look, and I said this too. Look. Here's a guy that's drowning. Look, it's important. Look, <laughs> somebody get me Romans, get me Romans 1 and 16. Here's a guy that's drowning. Now, it's important to know the guy's name. It's important to know where he lives. It's important to know what hospital you need to take him to. But the first thing, get the man saved first. See, get him out of the water first. Then you can ask him, well, who, who is your next of kin? Who do I notify? Uh, uh, do you need a blanket on you? Look, don't ask him, do you need a blanket on you? Haven't saved him yet. Get him saved first. See? Read. Romans 1, 16. Uh-huh. For I am not ashamed of the glad tidings of the Messiah. Now here's the apostle Paul saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, see, of Yahshua the Messiah. And then you read over there in the 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians, how he said, I delivered unto you first of all. So look, first thing is get the man saved first. Then you can tell him about all these other things that might be nice to know. See, but the first thing you want to give him is his salvation. See, because that's what you was first given. See, look, if he wasn't given salvation first, he couldn't come down here and save nobody. You see, so look, get the man saved first. Then give him all other little niceties that he might want to know about. See, but we don't know what we need to know. That's why I look. Go ahead and save the man first. Even if he's saying, look, what, uh, fighting you, and don't, go ahead, save him first. Then explain to him why it was necessary that you save him, because of what was in you. See, because some people don't want to be saved. See, and when Dr. Kinley came in, see, we didn't want to be saved. See, just like when you go back and read all through the scriptures, how that Yahweh had to make things happen. See, Moses didn't want to come back down here. Is that right? Yahweh had to make him come back down here. Look, Daniel had a divine vision, but he didn't have the revelation. So he had to send old Gabriel and say, look, go make that man understand the vision. Look, you're going to have to be made to do things. You're just not going to be able to do it on your own. See, and the one that's doing the making, see, is uh, your Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. And the only reason why he's making you is that you might have life. See, so that he says, as I live, then you live also. You see, but you're going to have to be made to have these things happen to you. Of your own volition, you'd rather stay in darkness, you'd rather stay in Egypt, you'd rather continue in the worldly things, you see? But Yahweh had enough mercy upon us, see, to just bring us on out, see? Let me have, uh, let me have over there in uh, Lamentations about 3 and 21. Lamentations 
3 and 21. Mm -hmm. This I recall to my mind. Now, this is something we all need to recall to our mind. Read. Therefore have I hope. Therefore have we hope. Read. It is of Yahweh's mercy that we are not consumed. W wait a minute. Read that one more time slowly. Listen up, folks. This Read. I recall to my mind. Uh huh. Therefore have I hope. It is of Yahweh's mercy that we are not consumed. Did everybody hear that? Keep that in mind. I mean, like we, different speakers are saying, if it's something we need to leave with you or, or have you take with you, is that realize the reason why we all are here and the reason why those who have a knowledge and understanding have a knowledge and understanding is because of, it's of Yahweh's mercy that we are not consumed. You see? Now, uh, let's move. Let's go back to uh, Romans uh, the, uh, 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the glad tidings of the Messiah. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. Read. Why aren't you ashamed, Paul? Read. For it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation. See, in other words, the gospel being Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection according to what's written in the law of Moses and in the prophets. See, it's the power of salvation to everyone that believeth. To everyone that believeth. See, so for your new people, it's nothing you got to do other than believe on Yahshua the Messiah as the scriptures have said. Now, you must be obedient to do that, see, but it's going to come through you believing, see, ba excuse me, based on the evidence and the witnesses that are being presented down here to you. Read some more, please. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Read. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh. Now, the righteousness of Yahweh is Yahshua the Messiah revealed from faith to faith. See, now look, we mentioned Jonah, and I'm going to mention Jonah quickly, because see, Yahshua the Messiah, they asked Yahshua the Messiah to show them a sign. I'm talking about these were the Jews of his day. See, they want to see a sign. And he said, no sign shall be given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the fish's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's how, again, when you're reading the prophets, the scriptures testify to Yahshua, the Messiah. And when you look at Jonah, see, Jonah was disobedient in that he was told to go to Nineveh and preach, and he took a boat going to Tarsus. That's disobedient, you see. But what Yahweh did, he caused a great tempest upon the sea, see. And then Jonah was down in the bottom of the boat sleeping. See, and the mariners, see, they were afraid after they seen this, this type of storm. See, this wasn't no everyday ordinary storm. See, this, Yahweh caused this one. See, and look, they woke up Jonah and the lot fell on him. See, and Jonah said, well, look, all you have to do is cast me overboard. Now watch. Jonah comes up, cast me overboard. The mariners say, look, let not this man innocent blood be on our hands. So you got a principle of blood. Now when they cast Jonah overboard, where did they throw him? Into the raging waters of that sea. See, that's water, you see? And then it says that Yahweh had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah up. Yahweh is spirit. So you got blood, water, spirit in the story of Jonah, see? And it says how that Jonah was in this fish for three days and three nights and said he cried unto Yahweh from the bowels of that fish See, and it says that the fish brought him where he should have been in going in the first place and spewed him up, see, on dry land. See, so you have blood, water, spirit, see, uh, in the story of Jonah, see, and then uh, a, a principle of a death in type, throwing him into that raging sea is, is likened to a death. He was buried in the belly of the uh, uh, fish, see, and then he spewed out. That's a resurrection, and then he said, when he was a day's journey from Nineveh, yet 40 days, and Yahweh will, see, overthrow Nineveh. But see, Nineveh repented. See, the thing we want you to see in these stories, look, you can see some things that will benefit you. Look, if you change your mind and come out of that ignorance and accept the fact that I didn't know I was ignorant, see, in other words, if you repent, Yahweh will save you. But now if you're going to continue willingly to stay in that state, of ignorance and darkness, then he had no way he's going to save you. See, because he's saving you through the light, which is his son, Yahshua the Messiah. Now, if you reject that, then he's not going to, he's just not going to save you. So, with those few words, I do thank you for having the privilege to say something to you.
For our third speaker of the evening, we will have the Dean of the Albuquerque New Mexico School, Dr. Fred Allen, Jr. <laughs> 